The following is a special video presentation of the Hennepin County Library. Homelessness is an issue that has received considerable attention. Surprisingly, one group of homeless individuals has received very little notice. This group has remained nearly invisible to the general public. This group consists of thousands of youth who live without permanent shelter. I'm 14 years old. I'll be 15 January 21st. Um, I've been homeless on and off for the past year, but basically straight for the last four months. Uh, I've been homeless for three years, um, and I've had places like off and on for like a month, two months, it never works out. Usually it's with somebody, and uh, it never works out. So. I'm 15, and I've been homeless off and on for four years. I've been homeless off and on for about three years. Uh, it's not a fun experience. I'm 17 years old and I'm homeless. I've been homeless every, off and on since I was 13, running away from shelters and treatment centers and my house. Um, that's, that's all I have. I've uh, been homeless for several years and I'm 19. Most statistics relating to homelessness are based on surveys of adult shelters. These surveys usually only include information about adults and homeless families. Homeless youth are almost never admitted to these shelters unless they are with a parent or guardian, and therefore, youth are often ignored by surveys. Homeless youth are hard, are hard to count, and there's, a, there's this big push to try and figure out what the numbers are. Um, to see if it's worth putting money behind. There's a problem there to begin with, leaving that aside. Nationally, no one argues with the conservative numbers of between 100,000 and 300,000 kids under the age 18 um, being homeless. Um, no one argues with, in the Twin Cities metropolitan area, there is 1,500 homeless kids on any given night. There are a lot of them out there. I would say that that figure is doubled easily by kids who um, bounce from house to house to house to house and never are seen by social services. By kids who are picked up by a pimp the first night and are dead in two months. That doesn't get counted as, as homelessness. Um, there's a whole population of kids that street workers don't see, drop-in centers don't see, runaway shelters don't see, and the only time I ever see them is when they've been beat up or shot in the emergency room. And I will go to the, down to the emergency room and try and say, hi, and meet with this kid, but I'll never see him again. Uh, the reality is there's a lot of them out there, um, and one is too many. So, so for me, when we talk about numbers, I think, how many does it need to be before it's a problem? Although poverty and economic conditions may be some common threads, youth often become homeless for different reasons than adults. Youth often run away, usually from abusive family situations, and some parents abandon their own children. As economic situations worsen, Many social services have been cut, and attempts at family reunification, foster care, or temporary shelter cannot keep up with the growing numbers. Well, uh, I'm not living at home anymore because I had problems with my mom's boyfriend. Uh, he doesn't like me very much, and um, I guess 
my mom's men come before her own children and uh, I had abuse, well, mental abuse and some physical abuse and sexual abuse there. I did get beat pretty hard uh, with my dad's fist or whatever he could get his hand on. I mean, I got a, a scar in my leg right here from where a belt buckle on. I mean, it wrapped around my legs and it ripped my leg one time. And uh, one time I had ran to my school that I was going to and there's photographers that came out and took pictures of all the whelps and bruises and stuff that I had up up and down me. I mean, he wouldn't care if he got my butt or what. He'd hit me in my head, my back, my legs, everywhere. I mean, most of the time I'd have to take my pants down to do it. And, yeah. Out there was the scariest part, was taking my pants down. When he said, take your pants down, I knew what was going to happen. I mean, it took me a while to do it. And a lot of times when I cry, he goes, you better quit crying, boy. I'm going to give you something to cry about. And he beat me again. Quit your crying, you know. I mean, you shouldn't ever keep anybody from crying, no matter what the situation is. And he didn't like me crying. You better grow up and be a man. That's what he said. Yeah. Yeah, that that disturbed me a lot. And my mother told me that she that I was a mistake. She wished she had never had me. She hates me and stuff. I mean that that messed with my head. Uh, I was went back home for a while. My ma, my mother and I did get along for a certain amount of time, but uh, things didn't really work. We. Uh, we were kind of really poor. We moved into a van because we couldn't pay rent. And, or, like, if we paid rent, we couldn't pay for our bills. And if we paid bills, we couldn't pay for our rent. So we moved in, into a van, and we were doing all right there. But it's like it was too close for each other, and we just really don't get along well. So we got into a fight, um, and she kicked me out. <laughs> I think the reason why we have homeless youth in general um, stems out of a larger problem, which is that as a society we really aren't paying attention to what's happening to our middle class and to our lower class. It's about poverty and it's about stress on, on families and pretty much the individual. Um, it also stems from a perspective in which historically we have looked at youth as property and children and women as objects to be owned. Um, when you combine those two things, what you have is family systems that are stressed and can't cope. So what they do is they get rid of the easiest object to get rid of, which is their adolescent. Unfortunately, what happens along with that is that we're always, as a society, wanting to save money. We're not wanting to put money into parenting classes, health care, um, job development. Um, and what happens with, with our kids is, is as we cut back on taxes and lower taxes, we cut back on things like child protection services. And so, consequently, we have homeless youth. It's, it's a direct result. If you cut back on social services, child protection, education, you have homeless youth. It's predictable. It's, it's, you know, it's not an accident. Well, I think, <clears throat> I think people need to understand the issue. When I go and talk about homeless youth to uh, an isolated suburban population, you know, what I get is people come up to me after and they say, why don't they just get a job? What's wrong with them, really? Or, you know, are they bad? Or, you know, have they, are they all criminals? Or are they all chemically dependent? People don't know the facts, and they don't have a clear understanding that most of these kids come from environments in which it was just unable to live. They were just unable to live safely in their environments. They come from dysfunctional families where abuse was prevalent. They come from institutional settings where they had no privacy and weren't respected as individuals. 
They come from areas, and, and most of the kids that we see on the street are survivors. They've left um, difficult situations looking for something better. So people need to understand that homeless youth are not criminals. I think what would need to happen for people in general to start paying attention to youth and, and to be aware of homelessness um, in youth in that population is that we would need to start dropping our, our, our automatic blinders. Um, you see a group of kids hanging out in front of the store, the first thing you say is, why don't they go home? Maybe there isn't anywhere for them to go home to. Um, in this culture, there's a way in which we see kids and we automatically assume they're doing something wrong. They shouldn't be there. They're going to cause trouble. They're going to commit crimes. Um, it's looking at kids through those kind of eyes that makes us blind to homelessness. Because they're a problem rather than, you know, our future. As, as a society, we're like, we're like, you know, that cartoon character that's sitting on a branch and sawing it off at the trunk and we think the tree's going to fall and we won't? The typical profile of um, a homeless runaway or throwaway youth is a kid that's basically exiting the home from a situation that's abusive or intolerable. Um, they basically have parents that are either abusive verbally, emotionally, physically, or sexually, or they have parents that are maybe abusing chemicals, or they, they're running away from uh, parents that don't know how to handle the kid when they get into their sexuality. Like a kid may uh, identify themselves as being gay or bisexual and, and the parents don't know how to deal with it or sexually active. And um, so, um, you know, the kid just, um, you know, eventually um, will exit the home. Um, and, 75% of the kids we work with have reported either been physically or sexually abused or a combination of both where they, where they felt like both things have happened. And, um, you know, basically it's kind of like um, a lot of people ask of these, these kids that run from the home, the streets are just as bad as, um, as, uh, as your home. Why do you stay out in the streets and, and leave your home? And one kid answered that really well. They said that, you know, you expect people that you don't know to abuse you, but you don't expect people who are supposed to care for you to abuse you. And so I think that's the best answer um, that, that could be given about why these kids, they, they really don't understand because, they, they, you know, their reality is that parents are supposed to care for you and love you and, and not be abusive and, um, to you. So I think that's one of the reasons why they, they do leave. Homeless youth come from everywhere, and they have all the problems that everyone else has. And what adds to their homelessness and their inability to get out of that situation is that they don't have any access to skills. They don't have any access to um, shelter. They don't have any access to things that regular kids do. Um, most people, most parents can relate to that launching stage that they have with kids, um, where the kid, you know, you get them in their first apartment, and they come back a week later with no food and wanting you to do their laundry. Well, these kids are at that same developmental stage, and they have no backup net, nowhere to go home to. So they, their problems are, are doubled. Many youth are disenfranchised and running from institutions. Youth do not have the legal rights of adults and can be arrested for minor infractions of the law, such as violating curfew or missing school. Homeless adolescents often attempt to be invisible to avoid the threat of institutionalization, since this often means being involuntarily placed in a correctional facility or into mental health or chemical dependency treatment.
I haven't been with my family since I was eight years old. Uh, they put me in a mental institution. I was an abused child, so uh, I didn't work out too good in school or with other people. And um, I was in a mental institution for four years, and that was kind of a crazy place. I was always running from there. They had me on the maximum security war for three years out of that four. I was still running, found ways to get out. And after that, they put me in DYS, that's Division of Youth Services, and that's a place for like teenage criminals. I wasn't no criminal. I never had no record until I turned 18, but nobody wanted me, so that's where they had to put me. I've been locked up a lot of times, I mean, for running away, and I've been locked up for emotional problems and for being a manic depressant and stuff like that. So, I don't know. It's, but basically, mostly for running away. I don't think anybody should have to, I mean, a lot of times I run away because of things that happen at home, but um, maybe it's the parents that should be locked up, you know. Maybe it's people that, it's not ever the victim's fault, but people don't really believe that, you know, I do because I've been a victim. But. Another issue I think that people need to realize is that kids don't trust this society because in essence there's a myth that we tell kids which is if you talk about the abuse at home, if you talk about um, people betraying you and not keeping you safe and not getting your needs met, if you talk about that, tell the teacher, tell the policeman, tell society, we will take care of you. The reality is that's not true. Um, these kids have been betrayed over and over and over again by the system because the system has an agenda for them. Whatever it is, it's not their agenda. What needs to happen instead <clears throat> is we need workers who will meet these kids and be committed to their agenda, be committed to helping them develop how they want to develop, rather than trying to control them and, you know, take, take Johnny, who is homeless, and make Johnny a model citizen. What we need to do is befriend Johnny and find out where Johnny wants to go. More than likely, Johnny wants to fit into this culture in some way where he's not constantly being beat up. But to just come to him and say, you know, grow your hair out or cut your hair, um, clean up and get a job isn't going to work because we haven't offered him anything. It's a population that really mystifies a lot of people. Population? This population that um, is real angry at the system and won't get involved and won't participate in the services or the programs that are being offered. No one understands that, and every, everyone says, what's wrong with them? We're, provide, we're giving them food, shelters, and clothing. You know, why don't they take it? And, and these are people that have been batted around by the system for a long time, and they've learned how to survive. These are surviving kids, and they're done with the system, essentially. Any sort of successful housing effort would have to work with them, would have to ask them what they want. You know, the, uh, they're not so um, different from every other human being that they don't want safe, a safe, secure place to live. They do, in effect, and are trying to create with their friends a community of safety. Um, so any program that works with them to create that has a chance of being successful. Part of the problem is we're we're very much a fix-it society. We see, we see an issue, and what we want to do is throw something at it. Mental health, chemical dependency, um, just, you know, come up with the newest, fastest, coolest model, and that's not going to help because these are people. You know, this isn't a chemically dependent, you know, walking around. You know, you don't have a, a schizophrenic walking around. You have a person walking around. 
That's not to say that that, that person doesn't need help around chemical issues. And, and that's not to say that that person isn't going to need some kind of serious therapy. That exists. But what's much, much more common is that this is an average person in a bizarre situation. Well, yeah, well, we have a system that assumes that what they need is treatment. The system says homeless kids are delinquent and delinquents need to be fixed. And so we give homeless youth, uh, we put them in correctional facilities and we put them in men mental health facilities. Um, when reality is, is that these kids have been in and out of correctional and mental health facilities for a long time and often all they need is a stable, secure place to stay. They're not looking for, the old saying is, I don't need another hour of therapy, I need a place to stay. And it's really true with this population. Let's show you how it's done. All right, um, I'm going to head on over to that many people are out. Once on the streets, youth attempt to survive without money or job skills. Finding food and shelter are immediate daily concerns. Youth will often risk their health and their lives to obtain the minimum necessities. Excuse me, sir. Did you spare any change so I can get something to eat? No, All right, thank you. Excuse me, ma'am. Did you spare any change so I can get something to eat? Excuse me, when you guys throw any change so I can do something you need? I'm going to give you a change. Oh, all right. Thank you. Come here, I'll give you a tour. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. You need more, huh? Yeah. yeah. Take my word. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I got. Thank you for any change so I can do something you need. Oh, it's all right. Sorry. All right. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yep. Oh, here we go. Have a good one. Thank you. Good night. There's not many people out tonight. Basically what a squad is, is uh, abandoned buildings, the little sheds like that, take um, over. Yeah, you yeah. just take over these old buildings, like, because there's no one in there. You get, like, set up a bed or something in the basement. I mean, you used to get, like, four or five people in there. You never squat by yourself because you always have to have someone else, you know, looking up because right. you don't know who else to come in there, you know, try and kill you, you know, rape you or something, you know. We're going to be going dumpster diving right now. Uh, basically, how you dumpster dive is you just jump in, the, jump in the dumpster and get all the food that you can. Um, do that because we have no food whatsoever, and when you get hungry enough, you'll basically do anything for food. So. Yeah. And dumpsters in the winter act as refrigerators and sometimes keep the food good. Yeah. A lot of times you and can it find it. It takes a while for it to spoil. Yeah, a lot of times. And occasionally you do get like bad food, and what you do is you just bite it off or cut it, rip it off, whatever. Um, let's go for it. Stink. Nothing. Damn. I need a What? That's rotten. Five old just drove by again. Oh, Here's kitchen stuff. Sometimes you might find yesterday's newspaper and you still find out what's going on in the news for free. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty scary. Uh, there's this bridge that I sleep under now 
and I mean it's like right by some railroad tracks I mean there's uh, all different kinds of uh, bridges that go through there and uh, you never can tell who's gonna go down underneath there with the gun or just with a bunch of people and try to beat you up I mean I never had any of those problems I mean but I hear gunshots and stuff and the trains go by in the morning it wakes me up and startles me I, I, I don't know what's happening um, I hear people getting raped underneath those bridges and stuff and I don't want to be one of them people. Uh, Most of the time I was staying with people that went to off streets, you know, I I felt like an intruder a lot of times because it was always a different person every night asking them or begging them if I could, you know, sleep on their floor or something. And up until a year ago, um, that's been happening and then I started sleeping under bridges and anywhere you know like an abandoned building or outside you know in in the parks and stuff like that a day of mine kind of goes like this I wake up and figure out where I am first because sometimes it's a little sketchy and where I sleep so I gotta figure out where I'm sleeping it takes me a couple of minutes to wake up, and it's kind of weird waking up in a place going, wow, where am I? Oh, yeah, I remember. Uh, in fact, that happened to me this morning. I slept in a van, so I didn't remember where I'd been sleeping, and I took the cover off, and it kind of freaked me out at first. So the cops just kicked me out of my house really recently. Uh, then after I wake up, I go and try to find myself some food. What I do to uh, pass time usually is go panhandle or dumpster dive in apartment buildings to try to find uh, nice clothes or uh, some stuff that I could sell to make money or um, just walk around and look at the people on the streets and stuff or uh, you know. Uh, that's basically it. Most of the time I'm panhandling it for money so I can get food out of the stores that I like so I don't have to dig in the dumpsters or go to these soup kitchens. I don't know, basically I'm afraid I don't really trust anybody, you know, not at all. Anybody comes up to me acting all nice, I wonder what they want from me because a lot of people try and you know, act like your friend and then they use you. You know, I've been raped a couple of times because of that. You never know what's gonna happen. You never know what's gonna happen. I mean, you sleep, you sleep in corners, you sleep under bridges. I never know if someone's gonna come up and rape me, if someone's just gonna come up and kill me, kidnap me. I mean, I don't know what's gonna happen. And it's really scary not to know where my next meal is gonna come from or who I'm gonna have to sleep with or have sex with so I can get a warm bed. I met this, this one woman. I stayed with her from, for about, let's see, three, four months, something like that. That was one of those, like, have sex with me, you can stay with me type deals. You know, no, that was really fun. Not really, but I don't know. Some people would think it is. Some guys would, but it, it, it's not because, you know, there's times, uh, there's one time it's like, no, I don't want to have sex with you. Well, do it anyway, you know, <laughs> or I'll kick you up. <laughs> so it's like, okay, <laughs> that's not fun, you know, and so I finally left her. Um, I've been offered money several, well, almost every day that I'm downtown to have sex with people, you know, like if I'm panhandling, a guy might come by and say, you don't have to do that, you know, you can come with me and, you know, I'll give you some money and I'll give, give you some food. That happens all over the place where people are asking me to do stuff with them and stuff, offering me money and stuff and I usually turn it down. One time I didn't because I was really, I was in a tough place to, you know. They 
will survive any way that they can. And a lot of times they learn very early when they're on the streets that their body can be the currency of exchange. And, and some kids, not all kids get involved in prostitution. Some kids get involved in um, criminal activities and some kids um, are very good at squatting, panhandling, and um, they, they survive that way by living off of um, waste. You know, we, we throw away abundance of number of food and um, these kids dumpster dive and, and they go to regular dumpsters and they basically can um, hopefully find food that won't get them sick, you know, but um, you know, these kids have survived any way they can now. For a homeless youth who needs money, the quickest way to get money is to prostitute, to use the only currency he or she has, which is his or her body. Um, but a lot of prostitution, though, doesn't take the form of classic prostitution that we all think of with a pimp and a prostitute and uh, the classic arrangement. It, it's more maybe mm, vague prostitution, maybe sex for food, sex for a place to stay, sex for drugs, or sex for friendship. Um, and that's, that's what I call survival prostitution. That's, that's sexual acts for any sort of necessity. We do street outreach where we go out on the streets where the kids are to let them know the services that are available to them as an alternative to prostitution. That's one of our goals that we have in our program. But for every counselor that we put out on the streets, we feel that there's 10 people that are out there exploiting them. I'm real, I'm real committed to doing AIDS prevention in the youth population. I think the youth have been neglected in AIDS prevention efforts nationally along with a lot of other groups but, but youth in particular and, and so uh, when it was clear that homeless youth were the youth at risk for HIV I began to learn about the homeless youth and <clears throat> what I learned was that in order to effectively do AIDS prevention with this population, you have to find these people housing before you can do effective AIDS prevention work. Because the reason that they get exposed to HIV is because they're on the street. And I can educate them as much as I want and give them condoms and do all those things that as AIDS educators were taught to do, but if they don't have a place to sleep and if they need twenty dollars to live and if um, they're out of money, then um, then they're a highly exploited population, then they're very vulnerable and then no amount of AIDS prevention prevents them from putting themselves at risk. And how, and we determine that by citing the and that's uh, based on your income. Youth service organizations are attempting to address the issues of youth and homelessness on a daily basis. But with limited resources, they can work only on a small scale. Activist organizations are also attempting to affect change by calling public attention to the issue. Youth service professionals offer a number of strategies for addressing youth homelessness and offer some predictions for the future. A phenomena exists within that which is that a kid will have a kid and that kid will be raised on the street. I have met, I've worked with probably four or five kids who um, have been homeless for more than 10 years. Um, which means that their parent was homeless. They are regular people who are pretty much separated from this culture. They're the kind of people who will tell you at any given moment where all the drinking fountains are in a building because that's their concept, that a drinking fountain is a survival thing. It, 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 they, they look at the physical structure of the world around them 
much differently than we do. As this problem increases and gets worse, and as time goes on, we're going to start to see more and more second and third generation people who, have, who are homeless. And I believe we will have a similar situation to what we have in Brazil, where kids are homeless, third and fourth generation homeless. They are literally without parenting from age five. They bond together at about five, like five to ten year olds. Um, by the time they're adolescents, um, they are so removed from society that they, you know, they live by, by mugging and looting stores. Shop owners in Brazil hire, hire gunmen to just shoot down children in the streets, homeless, not homeless, just shooting down kids. Um, we are preparing a revolution by not taking care of our youth. We are preparing for these kids to one day stand up and take what they need because that is human nature. And the ones who will be there are going to be the survivalists. These are going to be the kids who are, who are going to live no matter what. And, and at that point, they're not going to really care if it's nice to come into your home in Edina and take your food. They need to eat. Um, it's kind of if you want peace, you have to work for justice. Um, well, emergency shelter is important, but it doesn't answer the long-term questions. Um, the ultimate goal here is to have the young people be able to live on their own. So emergency shelter may house them for a few nights, but what they really need is a place that's going to be stable for a long enough time so that they can get their life in order and take care of what they need to take care of in order to live independently. So they need more than emergency shelter. They need some long-term, stable shelter where they can learn independent living skills. They can get their GEDs if they need them. They can uh, learn job skills. Um, they can address the issues that have put them on the street. Today, right now, what needs to happen immediately for youth, and specifically homeless youth, um, is that individuals and local communities and states and governments, this needs to happen on all levels. We need to readopt our kids. We need to, to recognize that, yeah, that's you know homeless Johnny, the neighbor's kid, but he's also my kid. There are specific things that we need. We specifically need more shelter, more transitional housing programs. Um, there is a tragic um, loss or lack of street workers, people who will go out and find these kids and make friendships and develop relationships with them on the street rather than have them drop in because there is a population of kids who will not come into a drop-in center, who will not come into a runaway shelter. Um, so we need, we need to keep having that street outreach. We need all those kind of tangible things. But the larger issue, the larger problem is that, you know, today when you go home and sit down and turn on your TV and <clears throat> have a can of soup, there are kids out there who don't have that. And it should be everyone's problem. Everyone should feel bad about that. And they don't. M most of the funding is, um, is what um, I feel is not adequate. It's not enough. When you, th when you think about um, the needs of the clients that you're working with, because you basically um, or working with a kid that doesn't have anything. I mean, a lot of times the kids have the clothes that, that they're wearing. That's it. They don't have anything else. And you have to start basically from scratch. And, um, you know, I don't like to, you know, as far as funding and where it should come from, 
you know, back in the early periods of time when they were dealing with adult homeless, you know, people were basically passing the buck. They said it's a federal issue, it's a state issue, and all this other stuff. And so no one really know, knew who was responsible for them. And you know, and my 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 uh, response to that is that I think that it's um, it's a federal and it's a state and local, but it's also a community issue. That these kids are part of our community, and that people in the communities need to be more involved in in the process. I think it's all of our problem. I want people to to know about about homelessness, and I want people to to feel feel what it's like. You know, I mean, they can't really feel it unless they're there. But I want to be able to, like, kind of say, look, here it is, you know, and let them kind of feel the emotions that, that we all feel. Basically, my goals and my plans are um, just to get housing and go on with my life for now. That's what my basic goal is. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I just think it's important for everybody to hear and see. Uh, maybe you guys will be in this position sometime, uh, and you'll need some help. And you know, maybe somebody will help you. I mean, maybe somebody won't. I mean, a lot of people aren't as fortunate as some people. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh. presentation of the Hennepin County Library. For more information on youth and homelessness, contact your public library. Or for a free information packet, call 612-541-7981. Assistance is also available by calling First Call for Help, 612-335-5000. Videotape copies of this program are available for free three-week checkout at Hennepin County Libraries. Videotape copies of this program are available for purchase by contacting Hennepin County Library, ASD Secretary, 12601 Ridgedale Drive, Minnetonka, Minnesota, 55343.